Hello, this is Dr. Hena Asil, and today we're discussing the answers to the uh, paper on Unit 3, October 2021, in the IAS and Excel syllabus. So, this is the first question of this paper. It says this question is about some compounds of strontium. State a test for the strontium cation. Remember that the test for these metal ions was the flame test. Do you remember the color you should get for strontium? Remember, for strontium, we get a red flame. And remember that when you uh, mention these tests, you should give the results. So don't just say do the flame test or add something. You have to tell me what uh, the expected result is. Then he says an unlabeled bottle was thought to contain solid strontium chloride. A sample of the solid was dissolved in distilled water for tests to identify the anion. Complete the table to give the expected results of the anion test. So the first reagent he added was barium chloride acidified with hydrochloric acid. The first thing you ask yourself, barium chloride is a test for what? You should remember that barium chloride is a test for sulfate. Now, do we have sulfate? He expects it to be strontium chloride. That means it is not supposed to have sulfate. And that means if you add barium chloride, you should have no change or no reaction because you do not have sulfate. Then he added silver nitrate. And we said silver nitrate is... Uh, test for chloride and with chloride it is supposed to give you a white precipitate. The next question says anhydrostrontium sulfate undergoes thermal decomposition at approximately 1300. Suggest why this decomposition is unlikely to be possible in a school laboratory. You have any idea about that? If he says, I need to heat it to 1,300, that is very difficult in the school lab because the Bunsen burner cannot reach this temperature. So the temperature is too high. The Bunsen burner cannot reach this temperature. Then he says, anhydrostrontium nitrate decomposes at this temperature. Describe how to ensure that the strontium nitrate has decomposed fully. How do we know if this reaction has been complete? Well, I keep reheating and reweighing. At the beginning, the mass will do what? The mass will decrease. And then, as I continue, the mass will become constant. State the color of nitrogen dioxide gas. What was the color of nitrogen dioxide gas? You should remember that it is a brown gas. Give the test for oxygen and the expected result. Well, what was the test for oxygen? Insert a glowing flint, it relights. The solid residue from the decomposition was added to distilled water. Give one observation for the reaction that takes place, identifying the product of the reaction by name or formula. So what is the solid residue? The solid residue is strontium oxide. So if I dissolve it in water, the solid dissolves to form a colorless solution because it will form strontium hydroxide. This other question says geraniol is used in perfumes and can be extracted from many plants. And he gives you some data on this compound and the structure of the compound and the first question says geraniol has two different types of functional group name the functional groups giving a chemical test and its positive result to show the presence of each group so i look at the compound what functional groups do we have well we have two types of functional groups remember that the double bond means it is an alkene and the oh means it is an Alcohol. So if I say alkene, what is the test for alkenes? Add bromine water. It turns from reddish brown or from brown to colorless, or sometimes we say from orange to color. The other functional group is the OH. Do you remember the test for the 
OH, the test for the OH is add PCL5, phosphorus pentachloride. We should get steamy white fumes because it forms HCl, hydrogen chloride gas. Here he's saying the compound is extracted by steam distillation, and he gives you a diagram. And he says the steam distillation product is geraniol and water. The water may contain dissolved impurities which have similar boiling temperatures to geraniol. The contents of the collecting flask are transferred to a piece of apparatus used to separate the geraniol from the water layer. Remember that he said that the geraniol is something that is a liquid. So how do we separate an organic liquid from water? You should know that we use a separating funnel. If we go back to the table that he gives me on density, you will see that the density of geraniol is less than one. So that you should know that the geraniol would float on top of the water. Then he says the geraniol will still contain small quantities of water. Remember that when you use the separating funnel, there is still some water in the compound. So describe how to produce a sample of pure dry liquid using a named drying agent. This is by adding anhydrous calcium chloride. We swirl until the liquid is clear. When the liquid becomes clear, no more. Uh, bubbles in the liquid, then we decant the liquid, and this is now a dry liquid. Remember, a drying agent like anhydrous calcium chloride. The hazard labels for pure geraniol are shown. Complete the table to identify the hazard. So, that first one you should realize means flammable, the second one is corrosive, and that one means it is irritant or harmful. State one precaution, other than wearing safety spectacles and laboratory coat, that should be taken when using pure geraniol because it says it is corrosive, so I should wear gloves. State the appearance of the flame when geraniol is ignited. Remember that geraniol is an organic compound. When you burn an organic compound, what you get is a black smoke. Geraniol reacts with excess hydrogen. State the essential conditions. Remember that geraniol is something that has a double bond. So basically, we're reacting an alkene with hydrogen. Remember the conditions was I should use nickel catalyst or platinum catalyst. Draw the skeletal formula of the product. Now, that is an alkene, and I'm going to react it with hydrogen, and that means the double bonds will open up and form single bonds. So this is the skeletal. He wants the skeletal. So you just simply remove the double bonds because that's what you get when you react with hydrogen. The next question says, a student carried out experiments to determine the enthalpy change for the hydration of anhydrous copper sulfate to form hydrated copper sulfate. To find the enthalpy change of solution of anhydrous copper sulfate, 25 centimeter cubed of distilled water was placed in a polystyrene cup, temperature measured. After 2.5 minutes, the 7.5 grams of anhydrous copper sulfate was added and the mixture stirred. So what he did was he put the water in the polystyrene cup, measured the temperature every minute for the first two minutes, and then after 2.5 minutes, that's when he added the anhydrous copper sulfate and started to measure the temperature every minute. So what do we have here? He says plot a graph of temperature against time. You know that you, the first thing you should do is label the, uh, the axes, uh, plot the points with small x's. Now, in this case, when we join it, I want you to remember that when we have temperature changes, we join it with straight lines. And then he's going to ask me, what is the maximum temperature change? So if this is my graph, the maximum temperature change is the temperature change between that highest point when we join the lines. Remember that we stopped at 2.5. That line in the middle is at 2.5 because that is when 
we added the anhydrous uh, copper sulfate. So from the graph, the difference in temperature, the maximum difference in temperature is 17.6 uh, degrees Celsius. The value of the enthalpy change from this reaction was this. So when he calculated the delta H, it is minus 39. Now give one possible reason why this value is different from a data book value. Remember that we said the delta H that we calculate is always less than what it should be, mainly due to heat loss to the surround. After another experiment to find the enthalpy change of solution of hydrated copper sulfate, the students constructed the Hess's cycle, calculate the enthalpy change of hydration, so it is the delta H for copper sulfate solid changing into hydrated. Um, he already draws this and he says calculate the enthalpy change. So you should remember that Hess's law says going from copper sulfate solid to copper uh, ions aqueous plus sulfate ions aqueous at the bottom, I can go in two ways, either through delta H and plus 5.6 or through the minus 39. So the total of one way equals the total of another. And we can use that to get the delta H, which comes out to be this number. Then he says, give one possible reason why the enthalpy change of hydration could not be found directly by experiment. Why can't we calculate it directly through an experiment where we measure differences in temperature and things like that? Because in this kind of experiment, it is hard to measure the temperature change of a solid. Remember that we're starting with a solid. Or you could say that crystals may not be fully hydrated. So it's difficult to know when I have added enough water so that all of it has become hydrated. Okay, the next question says, students were set a challenge by their teacher to produce a chemical clock measuring a 20-second time interval. They used an opaque solution that became transparent, allowing a black cross to become visible. So actually what they're doing here is opposite of what we usually do in a reaction. We have an opaque, we're starting with the solution so that I cannot see the X, and then I measure the time taken for the X to disappear, and they did the condition so that it disappears after 20 seconds. The students investigated now the effect of temperature. So they're going to do this reaction with different temperatures. They plot the graph for you. And he says, in this type of experiment, 1 over T is used to measure the rate. So calculate from the graph the rate at 15 degrees Celsius to a suitable number of significant figures and include units. Okay, so... He's saying 15 degrees Celsius. Where is 15 degrees Celsius? That's there. You go up to the graph. It's about 33 seconds. That means that the rate is 1 over 33. Of course, that means 1 over second. The rate, the uh, unit will be seconds to the minus 1. Sketch a line showing how the rate of reaction varies with temperature. Now, remember that when we increase the temperature, what happens to the rate? It should increase, but it's not a direct proportionality. It's not directly proportional, so it's not exactly a straight line. But as the temperature increases, the rate should increase. So this is what you should draw. Evaluate the student's results and decide whether it is necessary to repeat their experiments. Well, let's look at the results. He has a graph in which most of the points are on the curve except for one. So I would say that no, it is not necessary to repeat the experiment since only one point is away from the curve. So the points are already, most of them are uh, on, the, on the line of best fit or the curve of best fit, and only one of them is anomalous and we have already identified. State how you would change the conditions to make this chemical clock measure 40 seconds. Now, at the beginning, he was saying it starts opaque and it becomes 
clear so that I can see the X after 20. 20 seconds means a fast reaction. What if I want it to be 40 seconds? That means I need the reaction to be slower. That means I should use more dilute solutions or decrease the concentration of my solution. A technician found a bottle of sodium hydroxide at the back of a cupboard. The technician determined its concentration by titrating 25 centimeter cubed samples against, so 25 centimeter cubed of the sodium hydroxide, against 0.5 mole per decimeter cubed hydrochloric acid from a burette. So basically, he's doing a titration to determine the concentration of the sodium hydroxide. And he has a table, he says, complete the values. Of course, the titer is the final minus the initial. In this case, all of them are in two decimal places. So your answers should also be in two decimal places. State why the value from titration 2 was not used. Where is titration 2? Titration 2 says 21.6, but the others... 1, 3, and 4 are uh, not close to the 21.6. So the, we say that the 21.6 is not concordant with the other results, or it is not within 0.2 of the other results. So usually when we have uh, repeating titers like this, we choose the ones that are within 0.2 of each other, which we call concordant results. And that is the one that we use to um, calculate the average. So here he's saying calculate the concentration of sodium hydroxide in order to calculate the concentration of sodium hydroxide. The first thing I should do is get the volume of the HCl. So it is the average of the ones that are concordant, the ones that are within 0.2 of each other. So I get this volume of HCl. Then I can get the number of moles of the HCl because he gave me concentration somewhere. So this is the number of moles of HCl. Then he's asking about sodium hydroxide. So I need to go back and see what would be the equation. The equation balanced is this. So that means one mole of sodium hydroxide reacts with one mole of HCl. And that means the number of moles of the sodium hydroxide would be the same as the number of moles of HCl. And that means now I have the number of moles of sodium hydroxide. I can get the concentration because concentration is number of moles over volume. He told me that he used 25 centimeter cubed. I'm reminding you again, volumes in these equations have to be in decimeter cubed. So anything in centimeter cubed, I have to divide by a thousand. So this gives this concentration of sodium hydroxide. Then he said each reading of the burette has a, an uncertainty of 0.05. We talked about this in a previous uh, lesson. We said in a burette, you're reading the volume twice. You're reading it at the beginning, the initial volume, and you're reading it at the end, the final volume. For each of them, the uncertainty is 0.05. That means the actual result is within 0.05 of that reading. That means if you're reading it twice, then the uncertainty is twice of that. So the uncertainty is 0.1. And he's saying in titration 4, in titration 4, the volume was 21.35. So this is how you calculate percent uncertainty. If we're talking about a burette, the uncertainty is 0.05, but you're reading it twice. So it is actually 0.1. Now, he wants the percentage uncertainty for a certain reading. So it's 0.1 over the reading times 100. And the answer is usually in plus or minus uh, something percent. Then he says, state the color change that would be seen at the end point in this titration using phenophthalene. You should remember, what did he have in the flask? He had a base. And phenophthalene with sodium hydroxide is originally pink. And then when we do the titration, it becomes colored. Are we okay with all of that? I hope this was helpful and thank you for listening.